Welcome colleagues to KSU's Research with Relevance Friday Features. We are back again for the sixth episode of the Chairs and Directors Showcase. Th today we are featuring, I'm very excited, Teresa Rachek. She is the Chair of the Department of Geography and Anthropology and we have a great show in front of us today. My name is Phaedra Corso and I'm the Vice President for Research here at Kennesaw State University. Thank you, Katie, for clapping. <laughs> Here we go. Um, we do this show for, I think, the most important reason, which is to celebrate research here at KSU and also to stay connected as colleagues. As you all know, we started this show during the pandemic when it was really critical for us to have a lifeline to each other. Um, and we've extended it as we're still dealing with the pandemic. And we're um, excited to reimagine what research with relevance might look like for the future. And we'll be coming to you with some of those ideas um, over the summer. So a few housekeeping tips before we start. First, please make sure that your mics are muted, which I see that they are. If you want to focus on a specific speaker like Teresa, you search for her name and um, pin the speaker by clicking on the three dots next to her name. Finally, this episode will be recorded and will be available uh, through KSU's Office of Research and through our YouTube channel. So the schedule for the next hour is we will be watching a video that gives an overview of the research of Teresa, and then we will do a live interview and audience Q&A. If you have questions uh, that you would like to ask throughout the discussion, please feel free to put it in the chat function or you can raise your hand or you can interrupt us. We are very informal um, and we want to make this as interactive as possible. So let's go ahead and begin. Let me um, provide a, an introduction for Teresa Rachek. So Teresa joined Kennesaw State in 2011 and she became the chair of the Department of Geography and Anthropology in the summer of 2020. Her research focuses on heritage practice and the early complex societies of South Asia. During her career, Dr. Rachek has placed emphasis on incorporating students into her research. We love to hear that. And she has invited them to travel to India with her. She has excavated in France, New Mexico, Nevada, and Brooklyn. Ah, haven't heard about that one. We might need to ask a few questions about that. So uh, let's go ahead and start with the video and I'm gonna turn it over to you, Megan. My name is Teresa Rachek, and I am the chair of the Department of Geography and Anthropology. I'm an anthropological archeologist and I use collaborative and participatory methodologies. When I first started out in archaeology, I excavated Native American Pueblo sites in the southwest of the U.S., and I also spent a few seasons excavating Neanderthal sites in France. These experiences led me to be interested in the study of lithics, or stone tools, which I later studied in my dissertation. As a grad student, I began excavating in Rajasthan, India, as a crew member at the large site of Gilland in the center of the region. My dissertation was funded by a Fulbright, and I studied the lithics or stone tools from that site to identify connections between the residents of Gilland and nearby mobile pastoral groups. This was one of my first attempts to make sense of the ways that people built networks and communities across regions in the ancient past. After my dissertation, I began working with colleagues at Deccan College Postgraduate Research Institute in Pune and the Rajasthan Vidyapit University in Udaipur to investigate the nearby sites of Chetrakera, Javasya Arni, and Pachumpta. A colleague at Hartwig College joined us for part of this work, and we called our collaboration the Maywar Plain Archaeological Assessment after the name of the region, the Maywar Plain. All three sites are within walking distance of Gilland, so the people who lived in these places could have visited each other regularly, engaged in trade and exchange, married each other, and supported each other in times of conflict. These are the first farming villages and towns that arose in the region. So it's the first time that people began to form these communities and the social practices that connected them. Our team is currently studying early community formation during the time that the first farmers in the region settled down and built the first villages and towns roughly 4,000 to 5,000 years ago in Rajasthan, India. The society we study is often called the Ahar culture and it is just next to the Bronze Age Indus civilization. Both societies are contemporaneous. 
I'm also interested in the role of archaeology in the modern world and the way that contemporary communities engage with archaeology. My colleagues and I started our first project at Chetrikera, which is a small village with about 30 families. The current village is built on top of the site, which was highly endangered by encroachment. Village residents were digging the mound to make room for animal pens and new buildings. We started our work by mapping the site and talking to residents about the archaeological site. We asked them, who used to live here? Why are you digging the site? And what do you think about the old things that you find? They told us a lot of stories, and in the end, they agreed to excavate with us in the following season to find out more. Spending a whole season building relationships is unusual. Most research projects move much faster. But it's a critical part of collaborative and participatory methodologies that acknowledge the connections between people and ancestral communities. The local interpretations of archaeological finds are critical to building a shared understanding of the site, and the collaboration makes the work richer. Our team also takes time to present at schools and participate in community events. We welcome visits from local community members and work cooperatively with local press to share our findings in the local language. At Chetrakera, we dug two trenches and found possible evidence of a regional population shift between the Chalcolithic and Iron Age periods. At a time when the large site of Gilland was growing, the small site Chetrakera appeared to be shrinking. This shows that within the region, there may have been a movement to larger sites during the Iron Age. We later excavated at Javasia Arni, located on a stabilized sand dune, outside of a different village, and also at Pachumpta, located behind a school in the middle of a third large village. With permission of my Indian colleagues, I was able to bring KSU students on these excavations, and they played an important part of the research teams. We also hosted the Deccan College Field School one year and trained about 30 master's students in excavation methods. Directing a large excavation with lots of scholars, students, and local participants can be challenging, especially with several languages spoken on site. However, my colleagues and I work well together, and we've learned to solve some complex logistical problems so we can address our research questions. We are still sifting through the data from these sites, and we started to publish our first articles. KSU students have co-authored with us and presented their work at the Georgia Academy of Sciences, where one student won an award for their paper. Graduate students in India also completed their MA and PhD based on this work. One summer, I was able to bring a group of students to India for anthropological research on craft production. Working with translators, students studied with local artisans, learning how they made and sold crafts. All of the study abroad programs that I built have been fully immersive with students living in the towns and villages where they work. In the villages, for example, we don't get chai in the morning until the cows are milked, and we take bucket baths because of limited running water. KSU students live and work alongside Indian students and village residents, and they learn a lot more than if they had stayed in a tourist bubble. However, we do take time to see the sites and learn all about Indian history. I prefer methods that are explicitly collaborative and participatory which means that I work as a team with scholarly colleagues in the US and India, and we also include local communities in our research in key ways. I've been lucky that I've been able to include KSU undergraduate students in the research team as well, and provide them with hands-on research opportunities and culturally immersive study abroads. Collaboration is the heart of good archeological practice, and I'm grateful to my colleagues in India who have been so extraordinarily welcoming and generous with their time and mentorship. Our research has been supported by National Geographic, the American Philosophical Society, and my colleagues' institutions, Deccan College Postgraduate and Research Institute, and the Rajasthan Vidyapit. I'm also grateful to the American Institute of Indian Studies, which has offered important logistical assistance in acquiring excavation permits and research visas. Since the pandemic, it's been difficult to get in India to work, and my colleagues in India are also finding it difficult to keep up with field work. I have started a new project examining previously published radiocarbon dates and updating them with the new calibration curve published in 2020. I'm also using some Bayesian modeling where possible to try to refine the dates. 
Our goal of the project is to update archaeological chronologies across South Asia and to better connect archaeological events. For example, in order to understand how climate change in the ancient past affected day-to-day -day life, we need to accurately date both the climate change and the sites we think might have been affected by those processes. Good dating also helps us identify social change in general, trade and exchange, conflict, and other social processes. Across my career, I've collaborated on five edited volumes and published a lot of articles. My next goal is also to finish a book that I started connecting the Indus civilization to the region that I study next door. Part of that project was funded by the NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities. So there's a bit of urgency in completing it and sending it off for publication. The common thread through all of these projects has been the involvement of KSU students in the research. I've supervised a total of 52 independent student research projects in the 11 years I've been at KSU. It's been an honor to work with students, introduce them to archaeology and collaborative methodologies, and I look forward to continuing this work in the years to come. Terrific, thank you. Thank you, Teresa, that was really wonderful. Thank you for your time. Megan, thank you for your expertise in pulling that video together. Um, Teresa, I think you represent the everything that we talk about here at KSU. This is research that has relevance. We talk about community as our new fourth pillar of the R2 roadmap. And you, throughout this entire video, talk about how your research can only be done with the cooperation and the collaboration with community members. And I just, I just love this wonderful, shining example. And you also do work with undergraduate and graduate students. So you're really like hitting every single one of those pillars. So, um, so again, thank you. Um, I'm going to start off by asking you a few questions about your students because um, you, you talked about the number of independent studies that you have mentored or have, um, have run. You talk about bringing students on site. If I'm a student and I'm interested in the field of archaeology, which I don't know who wouldn't be, um, what are the skills that I would learn as a student and what might a student do on a dig, for example? That's a great question. Um, so, you know, students uh, come to archaeology, like you said, because it it captures the imagination. Um, and for some students also, they really want to connect to um, ancestors of the past as well. Um, so on a dig, um, they're going to really learn the research process. Um, and and that's all encompassing. Um, the students that I work with when we're on site, um, they learn how to work with the community members. That's an important part of the, the setup. Um, and then they learn how to um, articulate their own research questions, how to collect data, how to analyze that data, how to write it up and present it. Um, so they learn all of the stages and these these are really important skills um, that they learn that are valuable even beyond archaeology. So, um, you know, most of our students don't go into archaeology. Some do and they're very successful at it, but most of them instead take these skills that they learn and apply them um, in, in whatever field they they end up pursuing. So in the video, you talk about um students learning the craft production from the local villagers do you have to have an artistic part of your uh, of your training to or is it more just the the mechanics around the craft production well it's really um we what we really study is um how craft production is is socially embedded so the students um, in that situation, they're they're studying the craft production, but the larger questions are what role does craft play in society? Um, how are craft producers embedded in society, socially, economically, politically? Um, and so it's a broader question about looking at the world and how communities um, are formed, but also how different parts of communities and different roles in communities play an important role. Uh, Play, play an important role. So the students um, spend a lot of time talking to the craft producers. 
uh, we were lucky enough to um, connect with translators because we were in a city that um, the producers we wanted to work with didn't really have um, fluent English skills and our, our students didn't speak Hindi. Um, and so they were able to talk to the craft producers and really learn not just about the craft, but about the whole society. So the craft became a medium to learn about community. Yeah, great. So it look, um, looks like we've got questions rolling in already. <laughs> so I've got like 40 questions to get through, but I'm gonna turn it over to you, Tyler. Awesome, thanks, Pedro, and thank you, Teresa. The the video and your research are just absolutely astounding. It, it's really incredible to see the work that you're doing and engaging with students. Um, and my question is decidedly more rudimentary than anything that Phaedra has asked. Um, seeing the the scope and the scale of the sites that you're working in, the photos from the video in India, it just seems like such a huge territorial footprint that you're working in. So how do you know when you're doing a dig that you have something that's of consequence? Because I feel like you're just kind of looking for that proverbial needle in a haystack and you could put me in that site and I'd still be looking today and not know if something was of consequence or not. Um, so is that kind of a, a learned art that you have in your field or is that something that there's specific training that you have and that you give to your students? Right, so, so a lot of it is training. You have to learn how to read the pottery and how to read the stone tools to know what, what, what does this broken bit of rock tell me or what does this broken potsherd tell me? And you have to learn a little bit about that. But, um, you know, archeology span is a, a lot of needle in a haystack. We, when we go to excavate a site, it's, it's covered by dirt, right? So you don't know what you're gonna find. You think you're gonna find this or that, and then you start digging and you find something completely different and it might upend completely your research question and, and your preconceived notions which is actually really exciting um, because then it means we're about to learn something new. Um, so we have to be open to sort of those, those new discoveries that we didn't anticipate. But I'm gonna follow up on your question, Tyler. So, it, you know, your, your expertise is in the stone tools at, or the tools. What happens when you're on a dig and you find something that is not a tool and it's something else and it's outside your area of expertise. Do you have you had occasions where you've had to bring in others that could, you know, could take it from that point of finding this object and, and going to the next step? Right. So so archaeology is a, a team based discipline and no one person can completely learn all of the artifacts and all of the methodologies. So on our team, for example, we have somebody who specializes in pottery, somebody who specializes in fauna, um, somebody, uh, we, we send out our um, uh, soil samples to somebody who specializes in botanical remains and they, they sift the soil samples to collect those uh, botanical remains and, and can learn a, a lot about the plants that, you know, people were eating. Um, and so we work with uh, we, we try to form a team that has all of these expertise. And then if there's no expertise within our team, what we do is we find some a specialist outside that we can send some samples and, and get their feedback on. Um, definitely no one person can do archaeology by themselves. Um, Evelina, you've got your hand up. Um, yes, my question was, and Teresa, you and I've talked about this before, um, about the impact of COVID in, you know, on archaeology research. I know your research is so hands-on and, and you know, uh, requires that commitment to international tra uh, travel and working with um, often remote communities. And how has COVID um, kind of affected your research as well as the field as a whole? And kind of what are the plans to recover from that? COVID has had a, a really big impact. Um, you know, it the the excavation season, the field season in India is usually the winter time. So when COVID first hit, people were um, wrapping up their field seasons, a lot of people. I was not in the field that year. Um, and uh, people just kind of waited to see. But it did disrupt a lot of work. A lot of my Indian colleagues, um, you know, the universities there, um, followed a lot of similar protocols to universities here where they ended up uh, working and teaching remotely for a long time. Um, 
and field work was was shut down for a while. Some people are getting back to the field now, but it seems to be um, up and running more slowly. One of the benefits, if you can say that, to COVID is that because we were all um, stuck at home, uh, out of the field for a long time, it meant that it gave us a little bit of extra time to go back to data maybe that we haven't had time to analyze. Um, so that we had more time to do that. We had more time to work on publications that we'd been meaning to get to, but had been on the back burner, but nobody had time. Um, so it it did allow a little bit more time for some of those projects to um, unfold on that side of things. Um, you know, archaeology is really exciting when you're in the field, but to be honest, a field season is six or eight weeks of the year. And the rest of the year, you're either writing grants or writing reports or analyzing your data or publishing your data, presenting your data. Um, and so, um, you know, having that extra six to eight weeks to be home and, and work on that um, did, did make a big impact, I think, for a lot of people. Um, you know, for myself also, I'm switching gears a bit, um, partly because of being a chair, but partly because of COVID. Um, and I, I started up this, this new uh, project with the radiocarbon dates. Um, the big challenge for me was how to find new ways to include students in my work if I'm not going to the field. And the Radiocarbon Project provided an opportunity for that because we're, we're taking a look at a lot of published resources. Um, and that's, that's work that students can do from KSU or from home if they are um, online students. Great. Thank you for that question, Evelina. We've got a um, qu question from Brandon Lundy that came through on chats. It says about uh, asking about contemporary craft production project. Did you find any continuity between your archaeology and ethnographic materials? Are these crafts somehow connected to the past or are these new livelihood strategies? That's a great question. You know, the, the reason archaeologists study craft production is because, you know, we live in a modern industrialized world where we uh, if we want um, any any items for our house, whether it's um, a new pot or pan or new dishes or anything like that, we just go shopping um, or we go on the internet and we buy it and it appears at our door. Um, trying to understand how ancient people made the everyday things that they use in their life and how that was an important part of society, um, that, that takes a little bit of creativity on our part to try to imagine what it was like back then to um, you know, fill your house with the pots and the pans and the dishes and the things that you need, the baskets, what have you. So um, archeologists often work with contemporary craft producers who use traditional methods to try to understand, first of all, how do they make these things so that when we find an artifact on site, we can understand, oh, maybe they made it this way. Um, but also how, craft producers are woven into society um, and how craft production is a job. Um, it's a profession, it's a career, and how, um, how that can influence day-to-day -day life and influence um, society at large. So, um, so that's one of the reasons why archeologists like to work with contemporary craft producers, because it helps us really open up our imaginations about what the past was like. Um, I had the opportunity um, several years ago to work with contemporary uh, stone bead makers in, in Gujarat in India. So these are folks who um, for generations, there's been a community where they, they made stone beads by um, napping the beads in very specific ways. They made them by hand, grinding by hand, polishing by hand, um, even before, before electricity and, and a lot of the techniques that they use are very similar to techniques that we see in stone tools. So I went and studied with these folks for a little bit to learn, um, you know, what are those techniques? How, how do you hit the stone in certain ways and, and what does that mean? But through that process, I learned a lot more. I learned a lot about how they procured the raw material, for example, and how they um, had to be careful about all of the stone chips that they uh, made from the bead production were very sharp and dangerous and they had to protect their children 
So they designed their workshops in a specific way to keep the children safe. Um, so these are the sorts of things that are very helpful for archaeologists to learn, because when we see that at an archaeological site, we can say, aha, I've seen that before. Um, and so these sorts of studies are, are really helpful. You know, I will say, um, everybody lives in the modern world. And so the stone bead makers today, uh, nowadays, they actually use a lot of electricity for their grinding and polishing. Uh, the pottery makers use electric wheels. Um, so everybody's situated in a modern world now. So there's only so much we can learn from these studies and we have to make sure that we're not, um, you know, extrapolating too much when we look at these models for, for understanding the past. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Uh, Bill, you have your hand up? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, good morning, Teresa, and thank you so much for sharing with us about your research. Uh, I also think it's great that uh, you are involving students in your research. Um, and my question relates to what you had mentioned about using Bayesian modeling to perform dating from your field work. Um, I wonder if you have tried to involve students uh, who are math majors and or CS majors on this aspect of your research, since this is something uh, that they might be interested in doing. Um, and so this sort of relates also to the previous discussion about having people with different skills and expertise mm -hmm. uh, involved on your projects. Um, I have to tell you, I love that idea. I have not had the chance to do that yet. Um, and I think that would be phenomenal. The radiocarbon project really is still in the beginning stages. Um, and so the statistical modeling that I've been doing has been more experimental than definitive at this point. Um, so there's definitely room to bring people in who have more expertise in uh, those methods. And uh, yeah, if you have students, I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about that later. I'll be glad to help. Thanks. So let's, um, Teresa, I want to ask about the different sites that you've been at. So the, a good portion of the video focused on your work in India, um, but you also, um, you know, part during your training were in two different areas, very different areas. And then I just learned about Brooklyn <laughs> when I <laughs> when I read your bio. So so can you tell us a little bit, you know, do some contrasting between the areas and what you might learn or what you studied in those areas? Well, um, yeah, I've been really lucky that I've, I've been able to excavate in a wide variety of places um, and different time periods as well. So my very first field school was excavating a Pony Express stop in Nevada. Um, and so that was a historic period site and it was called Jacob's Well. We found the well, or I found the well actually. Um, and uh, and uh, that was a really, really interesting um, first exposure to archaeology. Uh, one of the things we learned uh, is that wells are places where people often hide things. So we found um, even though the, the Pony Express stop was uh, supposedly run by uh, a group of Mormons, and we found in the well a lot of champagne bottles. So that was very interesting. <laughs> um, so archaeology can always uh, tell you things that, you know, the history books might not. Um, and uh, then um, after that, I was able to excavate with Arizona State University out at a Pueblo in New Mexico um, and um, there um, really learned a lot about um, excavating architecture and, and really just good solid methodology. Um, my favorite artifact from that excavation was there was a, a pot of um, completely blackened burned beans um, and it it seemed that be, somebody must have cooked dinner this is my favorite artifact i've ever found by the way somebody must have cooked dinner burned all the beans gotten really mad and just thrown the whole pot away um uh -huh. yeah because i found it that. in the trash <laughs> pile um so uh that's my favorite favorite artifact ever um because you can really see, like when you can really connect to the past and really see that. Um, my, my second favorite artifacts are, are potsherds. Sometimes you find potsherds where the potter left a fingerprint on the potsherd and you can touch that fingerprint and you're touching somebody maybe from 5,000 years ago. Um, it's just amazing. 
Um, so, what, so, so what was the Brooklyn? What was the Brooklyn dig? So the Brooklyn dig was just, uh, I just volunteered there for a little bit. They were excavating an old farmhouse actually um, and uh, learned a little bit about the architecture out there because um, we were excavating right next to the house. And that, that was a lot of fun um, out there with Brooklyn College. And, um, but I, I also spent a little bit of time doing contract archeology. span So a lot of our students from KSU, when they graduate and they wanna do archeology, span they go into the field of contract archeology. span um, there's a robust contract archaeology, um, you know, business uh, here in um, Georgia. There's there's a lot of opportunities for our students. Um, so I did that in New Mexico for a bit, um, getting paid to do the archaeology because of certain federal regulations. You have to do archaeology before development happens, for example. So it, can you explain to me a little bit about the permissions that are involved? Um, particularly in a place like India, it's, I imagine it's not you just showing up in the middle of, you know, someplace with a shovel, you know, I, I, is, I, I would imagine it would be years and years of red tape that you have to go through to get access. We have to be really, really careful about permissions. And that's true in the U.S. as well. Um, but when you're working in a foreign country, you not only have to be careful about the legal permissions, but also um, you have to be, um, you know, sensitive to the community's needs and, and recognize that you are a guest in that country and that um, you have to be careful about getting not just permission, but real, real true buy-in from people. So when we work in India, we have to get, um, whether it's a, we're doing survey or excavation, we have to get a permit from the Archaeological Survey of India. Um, so that's a um, really full application process um, it's approved at many, many levels of government. And even after we get the permit, we have to get research visas. Uh, and that's a whole other level of getting permissions. Um, so planning ahead to do an excavation sometimes can take years. And um, the Archaeological Survey of India, um, you know, they, they issue the permits and they're, they're very careful about um, the way that they allow this research to unfold. And so, um, after we're done, we have to submit reports to them to make sure that we've met all of their requirements. And sometimes they visit us on site as well. Um, when it comes to the community, you know, we start by getting buy-in from the community. So we'll meet with the community leaders, uh, whether that's elected leaders or informal leaders like school teachers or um, other prominent members of the community. And we will also go door to door and just talk to people about about the archaeology, about the past, about their interests, um, and try to make sure that we have complete buy-in um, and also include them in, in the research process to the extent that they want to be included. So that leads me, I think, nicely into a question about ethics. I would imagine that there's, I imagine that you, you, you have a course on ethics for your students who are engaged in this type of research, and that there's ethical issues around um, perhaps human remains that one might find, but also artifacts that that you may that one may want to remove from a country or from the origin to another uh, location. So, what are some of the the big ethical issues in your field right now? You, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Ethics are really, really at the heart of the of every project. They have to be, um, and so that that is sometimes legislated. Um, and so when it comes to artifacts, for example, in India, artifacts are not allowed to leave the country. So we work with um, the universities, my, my collaborators' universities have museums and they accept those artifacts there and they're stored there. And all of the analysis we do happens there. Um, so we never take any artifacts out of the country. Um, and I, I definitely train my students in, in not just the law, but the, the ethics of that as well. Um, you know, I think, I think working with communities is also an ethical practice. I think that's really important um, that they have a firm um, say in the type of research that happens in their community. Um, and then when it comes to human remains, that's a very serious topic. Um, you know, I've, I've only excavated one set of human remains. This was out in Texas. Um, when I was doing contract work, um, there had been, there was a cliff and there was a, 
um, some human remains were being eroded out of the side of the cliff. And Texas law um, requires that human remains, um, if they're encountered like that, they have to be recovered and reburied. Um, and so I participated in a team that recovered these human remains on the side of a cliff, which meant that we had to do our work. We had to hike vertically up, do our work like on a little narrow shelf about three feet wide um, and bring everything down. Um, and it was it was tremendously uh, meaningful work and, and very um, uh, sober, somber work, I would I would argue. Um, to recover. Th these were human remains that were about a thousand years old. Um, working in the U.S., uh, there are laws that govern human remains. So there's a law called NAGPRA, uh, the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, um, and that governs the way that Native American remains um, can be recovered and stored and these sorts of things. Um, so at KSU, we follow all all laws, Georgia laws, all federal laws, including that for, uh, about human remains. Um, and we're very careful about that. And we also um, have high ethical standards about our collections. We do have some small collections of human remains for our biological anthropology program and our forensic anthropology program. And those are really crucial to um, teaching and research and we um, store them very carefully um, and we are very respectful and we teach students to be respectful when working with those remains. Good, thank you. Um, Tyler, you have your hand up? I do, um, another question for you, Teresa. Um, you mentioned your students doing work um, and most of that obviously probably gonna be close to home to avoid all of the headaches of travel. So I'm curious from your perspective, what would you say is the most robust and noteworthy site in Georgia that we may not know about? That's a great question. You know, there's a site just 20 minutes north of KSU called Etowah Indian Mounds um, that it's probably my favorite because it is in our backyard, but it's phenomenal. Um, it's, I, I think it's one of the most important sites in the US, frankly. And before I came to KSU, I was teaching at the University of New Hampshire. I used to teach about Etowah because it's so important. It was one of the few US sites that I would teach in a class that covered all archeological sites around the world. Um, so if you've never been to Etowah Indian Mounds, take a Saturday, go out there, you can run around, you can, you can um, go up to the top of the mounds. They have a small, but really a nice museum um, definitely go see it. It's worth it's worth a field trip. Great. Uh, and I'm going to follow up Tyler's question with another question, which is um, of all the museums in the world that have artifacts that are, are of interest to you. So the you know, the, the stone tools, which museum is your favorite? That's really hard. Uh, I've been lucky enough to go to a lot of museums around the world. Um, I have to say, not necessarily for the stone tools, but for some of the other uh, third millennium BC artifacts would be the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, in the basement, they have a phenomenal collection um, on display. Um, it's, it's mind blowing. It's absolutely mind blowing. Um, but honestly, um, even here in Atlanta, if you go to, say, the Carlos Museum, they have um, some small collections from about 3000 BC. They have obviously their ancient Egypt is their big their big display, but they have, um, you know, Near East, South Asia, a few other regions. Really, really nice. And then they also have a lot of really great stuff for um, uh, the Americas um, and they have some great stone tools on display there, too. So I'm just curious, when you go to a museum like this, how many hours do you spend? Because <laughs> because I, I remember, I've gone to the Louvre a couple of times and the Louvre takes days to get yeah. through. And the, the really old artifacts, it's like by the time I get to them, I've already spent two days going through like the Renaissance period. And so I, I can only imagine that you just, <laughs> that you spend hours and hours and hours. I think I do the museums in the opposite way you do. I go straight for the old artifacts. But it's 
Yeah, I could spend hours. Um, there are certain museums that I, I try to go to every year because they're amazing and I could look at their stuff every year. Um, my favorite thing is to go to museums with other archaeologists because they'll just run right to their favorite artifact and they'll pull you along and they'll show it to you. And um, so, for example, my my favorite artifact, if you've ever been to the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, my favorite artifact is a little red uh, pottery bowl and it has two little feet. So it's like a bowl on feet. It's like the bowl could get up and walk away. It's the cutest thing I've ever seen. Um, and it's I, it's an offering bowl, of course, um, but it's it's my favorite artifact. And I always go run and, and, and see that first. That's great. All right, there's a couple of questions in the chat. So this, is, uh, this question is, uh, you mentioned incorporating additional methods such as radiocarbon dating. In terms of future plans, are you thinking more about continuing longitudinal work at the same sites or incorporating more region sites? That's a great question because I would have asked the same. This is a hard one. Um, so I will say when you excavate at a site, you usually fall in love with it. And you, you know, we usually only excavate maybe 1% of a site, if that. So you want to go back and you want to go and do more um, at any given site. But it's always nice to go and go to new places too. So it's that's a really tough question. Um, I will say at this point in my career, I am limited by my languages. So I speak, um, you know, French and Hindi basically are my two main, main foreign languages that I can speak. So it would be very difficult for me to start up in a different region of the world. Um, but I have thought about, um, you know, other places where they, they speak a bit of um, Hindi Urdu that, you know, maybe have some similar sorts of sites um, could be could be an interesting could be interesting. Yeah. So th so that's a you know, that's a good point, Teresa, about languages. Um, if if you're at the level of archaeology at the Ph.D. level, is it is it a requirement that you have? more than one language? So my PhD uh, program required two languages, one for reading. Um, so I chose French because a lot of French archaeologists have, have done work all over the world. Um, and then one for speaking, which is usually the local language where you're working. Um, so I, I chose Hindi. Um, and so I, I learned Hindi in grad school and my Hindi is choppy to say the best, but it works. Um, and I think especially if you're going to be making these partnerships with communities, if you're going to be seriously invested in, in working with communities in a meaningful way, you have to be able to speak the local language. So um, so that is important at the Ph.D. level. Um, you know, certainly uh, student at the undergraduate level, I think it's um, it's less important students that, that I brought to India. Um, they've they've been able to get by with English. Um, and certainly in the camp, because the the university students that we work with in India all speak fluent English, so um, so it it works there for them. Great, um, Bill. I see you have your hand up. Uh, yes, and this question actually is sort of uh, related to what has just been discussed, um, in that you had mentioned certain challenges, Teresa of carrying out field work in India, such as the communication and language challenge, which you just uh, briefly mentioned about, uh, and also like having to take bucket bath. <laughs> uh, so how about the food? Was that challenging for you? Or, you know, maybe uh, it was a challenge for the KSU students that worked with you? And if so, what do you do to prepare the students in advance for this and the other challenges? Well, I. I have no issues with the food. In fact, I love the food. Um, and often um, we stay with with families, and so we get home cooking, which is always better than restaurant food. And so we usually eat quite well. Um, in fact, most of the students that I bring with me to India end up gaining weight because they eat so well, <laughs> which is which is I think a good testament to how well we're feeding them. Um, some of the students have trouble with the level of spice. Um, it's difficult for them to eat spicy food, some of the students, and so we always accommodate um, and we always make sure that there's something available that's that's less spicy. But um, uh, yeah, the, the food is actually a really, really um, 
great, great part of, of the project. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. That's a good question, Bill, especially because we're coming up on lunchtime. And so everyone's stomach just did a. Oh. <laughs> uh, so here's a question from Monica in the chat. It says thoughts on the Indus Valley civilization in general as an archaeologist versus a historian. And that's how she learned about it. That's a great question, because there are two ways to, to think about ancient India, and one is through the, the texts that we have, right? Um, and then the other is through the archaeology. Um, you know, I, I was never in a position to learn Sanskrit myself, and so I um, decided I would only look at the archaeology when I study the Indus civilization. Um, and I know that there, there are other people who try to tie texts to the archaeology, um, and I feel like because I don't know the Sanskrit, I, I can't really speak to that. But, um, but I think it anywhere in the world, archaeology can provide something that historical texts can't always provide, which is that it can tell you about the everyday life of um, a society. That often texts don't always capture that nuance. Um, I think the Indus civilization is one of the most amazing ancient societies on earth. And the, they, these are some of the first cities in the world, with some of the first indoor plumbing in the world. Um, they had these massive long distance trading networks. Um, some of the, the technological innovations that they did and the so, social innovations that they did were phenomenal. Um, and it is unfortunate that they're not as well known as say ancient Egypt or um, even Mesopotamia, um, but uh, I think it's it's definitely something that I teach my students a lot about the Indus because I think it's worth it for that story to be told um, because because the Indus was so phenomenal. Great, thank you. Evelina, you have your hand up. Yes, um, in talking with you, Teresa, I, I think archaeology and anthropology offer some of the most exciting field experiences for students. I can see them totally getting super excited about this. And I know you work a lot with students. So I was wondering what archaeology students that that do these field experiences with you or or um, other colleagues, what do they end up doing after they graduate? Well, some of them do go to archaeology, which is great um, because their training in India teaches them to solve problems in a different way. And so when they do that work um, here in the US, you know, they've told me later that they were able to solve problems that their colleagues didn't know how to do because of the training they got in India. Um, so that's great uh, for colleagues, for, for students who um, go in a different career path. We had one student who end up working for a company that does translations, um, which I thought was a really nice fit because they were one of the students who had um, worked with the craft producers and had worked with the translator and so sort of had 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 that immersive experience and then realized the value of translation. Um, and we have we actually end up having a lot of students who go in the medical field, um, which I think anthropology and um, international study is a great preparation for going into the medical field because it helps you understand um, people who come from all walks of life, from all countries, from all backgrounds, and it really provides that training and cultural competency that is so critical to being successful in the medical field. Yeah, and I would also say that anthropology is a good background for public health. Um, I, I know when I was working at the CDC in the Center for Injury Prevention Control, we had several anthropologists that that I think naturally gravitated towards public health because it's the same thing trying to understand the community um, in the in the prevention of disease I do want to ask you a question about something I saw in the video where where you were asking the local villagers questions like you know do you know who lived here in the past and maybe asking some um, kind of historical questions of the of the current local vi villagers and I'm just curious to know about how much do they know about their history and, and in particular how you might contrast with that with how much um, you know someone here in the US might know about their history which might be very little. Well um, you know history's 
th there's school history, right? You learn history in school. And then there's a the history you learn through your community. Um, and so I think that's true here in the US as well as in other places. Um, one of the things that we learned in um, the village where we were working um, very specifically on this, this topic was that at least in Rajasthan, there are traveling historians, they're like bards who um, go village to village and they'll, they'll stay in each village for a week or two weeks and they put on these nightly performances where they sing about the history of the area. And so when we first started talking to people, um, they told us, well, you shouldn't be asking us these questions. We don't keep the history. You need to talk to these people because they keep the histories and we're going to get it wrong. They, they're the ones who know it. You should talk to them. Um, and so there's this understanding that there are historians who keep the facts in order. Um, and part of what those historians do, these singing bards, is when they come to the villages, they also ask, who was born this year? Who, who died? What else is going on in this village that needs to be incorporated into our history? Um, and so when they go village to village, they collect the stories and then they share them. Um, obviously, nowadays, they also have cell phones. And so um, people don't have to wait for the annual visit. They can actually call up in between and, you know, share some news. Um, so that's that's changing things as well. Um, so that's one of the things that we learned is that people really um, do respect the work of historians, um, whether they they are sort of university historians or community historians. Love that. There's a, um, a, a good, I think, final question here in the chat, uh, which is, what is the nexus between international conflict management and archaeology? In, in two minutes or less. <laughs> That's a great question. You know, I teach a class called Heritage and Conflict um, because when it comes to heritage, um, as, as we know, um, heritage is a really um it's connected to our identity but it's also connected to to our communities and and that's always a political thing um and so when people think about their past uh all of a sudden different political questions arise and different political tensions can arise as well um and this happens in archaeology too that there can be tensions about specific sites that are part of histories that are connected to political presence um, and so archaeologists have to be very careful about treading between different paths and different communities and um, making sure that we aren't, um, you know, fomenting dissent um, and fomenting conflict. Um, and we have to be very, very careful about these things. Have you had um, an example in your past, Teresa, or, or, or maybe a, another colleague? where they kind of had that conflict, where they had to stop what they're doing and reset or go somewhere else because the conflict couldn't be resolved? I have heard of, of colleagues who, um, you know, basically they didn't do their homework in working with communities ahead of time. Um, and when they began excavating, um, the communities asked them to stop and leave. And so that, that can happen. Um, I think uh, a lot of archeologists um, are very careful about picking the sites that they they, they excavate and the research questions they ask because they don't want to contribute to conflict in any region. And so they, um, you know, it's it's important to sort of stay, to stay in areas that um, can instead actually maybe promote, you know, sort of understanding and cooperation among communities. Um, so that happens too. Great. Well, again, thank you so much, Teresa. I think this has been just um, a wonderful time to learn about the great research that you're doing. Um, such a, a wonderful example of community collaboration and work with students. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much. And, and also thank you to Megan for helping um, put, put the video together. Yes, thank you. And thank you definitely, Megan, you did such a great job with the video. And um, thank you, uh, Phaedra, for inviting me to do this. And I, I really enjoyed um, talking to everyone and, and some really thoughtful questions, too. Thank you.
Absolutely. So the next and final episode of the Chairs and Directors Showcase for Research with Relevance, it's going to be our last of the semester, is April 29th at 11 a.m. And we will be featuring Dr. Monica Nandan from the Wellstar College of Health and Human Services. And it should be a, um, also a terrific show. And with that, we're going to close a few minutes early. We wish you all um, happy holidays. I think there are several high holidays uh, being celebrated today. Um, so have a wonderful, safe, happy, healthy weekend, and we will see you all soon. Thank you.